Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in. I am so excited today to dive into how to grow a podcast to 1 million downloads in just 200 episodes. And to teach us all the tricks of the trade here, we have Benjamin Brandt joining us, and we are going to dive into his podcast, what he's learned over the years doing it the last five years, and even more exciting, how it has impacted in a very significant way the tremendous growth he's seen in his AUM. So Benjamin, welcome. Do you go by Ben or Benjamin? I should ask that first. Uh, I've got no preference. As, as my grandma would say, you can call me anything you like, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> I'm the same way. Sam, Samantha, either one is fine. So I just have to start off by saying congratulations because you just shared that you hit a hundred million in AUM just, I think it was last week. Um, and you know, when you tweeted about it, you said, if you're on the fence about becoming a financial advisor or content creator, um, that your AUM doubled since the worst of the pandemic. And you attribute a big part of that to the podcast. So congrats. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been a long time coming. I, I, we actually hit 99 million four different times and then came back. So it was like, I never <laughs> checked my AUM on Fidelity, but these last weeks, like every morning, like logging in, like, did we hit it, did we hit it? So finally, fourth time's a charm, we, we broke through 100 million. So what made you get started with podcasting in the first place? And, you know, once you did get started, how long before you started to see some traction? Okay, so so the the, the origin story, if I was a Marvel character, the so we're in Bismarck, North Dakota, which is 33 miles from the geographical center of North America. So it's literally in the middle of nowhere, and which is great. I love being in the middle of nowhere, you know, hunting, fishing, all that, all that fun stuff that, that rednecks like to do. But we're very coal and oil orientated like that's all that's a big employer here in, in in the middle of the midwest and so i would i would i was very old school with my with my marketing right i would i would be very referral based which is totally different now i don't take any referrals at all I never ask for them but i was totally referral based and i would meet people at these conferences these oil and gas and coal conferences and you know i was middle 20s at the time and i would notice like all of our clients were coming from coal mines and oil fields, and they were all like 59 years old. And then, then they'd be 55 years old and they'd be 49 years old. Like I could see that not only was this, was this a diminishing resource, these people that were retiring from the coal mines because they built all the coal mines in the early eighties. And it's just this, this like generational hire. And, and right. so, so they were going to go from the average age of like 55 to 35. So not only were these retirees disappearing, which was my niche, every financial advisor in town knows that they've got a million dollars at Vanguard and a million dollars in their, in their pension. And so I thought, geez, either I'm going to have to get way better at marketing. I'm going to spend more at marketing, which is going to squeeze my margins, uh, or I'm going to have to figure out the next thing. And the next thing can't be geographically regional because everybody else is competing over a more finite number of resources. And so I thought I was going to be a blogger for a quick minute. Uh, but if you know me, you know that I'm just, I'm marginally literate, right? It took me like six months to write like a C minus blog post. And then I, I realized I was subscribed to like 28 different podcasts at the time. This was back in 2015. I was like, it's right there in front of me. I figured out who the retirement answer man was. And I started listening to his show now, Roger Whitney's a good personal friend of mine. Uh, but I said, let's try this whole podcasting thing. Um, yeah, and then it, and then I talked to absolutely no one for an embarrassingly long amount of time, and then eventually using some SEO tricks that I'm happy to talk about, uh, it blew up, and here we are. Okay, great. Yes, we'll definitely come back to those SEO tricks. So, when you say you you talk to absolutely no one, so in the very beginning, how many episodes would you say you did before, like that you were, nobody was really listening necessarily unless they knew you and you had told them about the podcast. Right. Yeah. So I talked to like nobody. I, 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 I came out of the, out of the barrel, you know, smoking hot. I, 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 I got like two or three episodes in. I was like every week I was going and then I got like four deep uh, and I totally lost momentum. I was still treating it sort of like a blog where I'd have like just one thing I'd talk about for 20 or 30 minutes. I just totally ran out of steam and I kind of burned out right away. So then I, I'd switched to like two episodes a month, but it wasn't a consistent twice a month. It was like maybe two weeks, but then four weeks of silence. I was just trying to figure all this out. I had nothing to base it on. I was just sort of flailing around in the ether, right? I just, I just had nothing. I had nothing solid. Uh, and it wasn't really until I, I really got specific with first and 15th, just like payday, 
uh, published an episode on the 1st and 15th, and then I hired Steve Stewart as my editor. So I had somebody depending on me to, to as, as, a, as a team member to get them my content so that he could edit it and get it out on time. So it wasn't really until I treated it like it should be treated and regimented it that I really started to see some, some growth and some people tuning in and then also with some SEO stuff. So I talked to, you know, I'd go and I'd like refresh my feed every day and like, ooh, 30 people listened to my show last week. But in reality, it was probably just me like refreshing the feed that it was counting. <laughs> so it's like, I was probably talking to even less people than I thought I was talking to, but, right. but it's so, just, it's, just, just by being stubborn, just by no other thing than being stubborn, I stuck with it and eventually it paid off. Yeah. And that was one of the questions I, you know, had wanted to ask you, because I think in episode 199, I heard you say, uh, this is the hobby that you've stuck with the longest more than anything else. So, so having that schedule, the first and the 15th is, would you say that's really what you attribute sticking with it to? Cause that is any kind of content creation, that's the hardest part for people is not giving up when they don't get, see results right away. Yeah, and you got to be careful what you measure too. Like as financial advisors, I think our, our mind automatically goes to clients in AUM, but really it might take 100 episodes for somebody to be comfortable with you enough that they're going to give you their life savings without ever meeting you or going into your office, especially if you're dealing with retirees. Less so the case now than it was five years ago because podcast is much more prominent. But I would, I would really encourage podcasters, financial advisor podcasters to measure engagement because engagement comes before those meetings and before that AUM. So what would engagement be? That would be like reviews on your show. That would be like listener questions that people are sending in. That would be people just responding to your, to your weekly emails uh, that you're sending out saying, hey, love the show, great job, whatever it is, maybe have this guest. So just maybe measure engagement uh, as a precursor to AUM. If you just oh. if you're just focused on AUM, you're going to get burned out of it because you have to do so much work to get that. It's going to be a hockey stick eventually, but yeah. just that first client, that second client, it's just going to take way too long. It's not right. like buying a Facebook ad that pushes people into a, a, a evergreen you know a webinar. It's just it's totally different. It's nurturing almost more than it's marketing. I love to hear you say that. And we usually say even if you're if you start off doing it consistent, it can take about eighteen months for organic marketing to start producing results. And, you know, think about if you see a new show pop up and they have five episodes, you're not immediately going to be like, oh, this is the expert I want to talk to. You think this person is just getting started at something. But if you find somebody and they have 200 episodes and they have a variety of guests and they've gotten all these other content pieces that go with it, you know, they've proved their expertise uh, that way. But, you know, let's talk about engagement for a minute there. Um, I often find that the content that, that, consumers we all actually engage with surprises the content creators a lot of the time like it's not what you think it would be so I don't know if you found that true I'd love to hear your take on it but tell us what are some of the most popular episodes that you've released so so the the, the kind of dirty secret of podcasting is it's exactly the same as blogging in almost every single aspect everything that worked for blogging today minus 10 years is what's going to work for podcasting today and 10 years into the future. And if you spend any time on, I don't know if Buzzfeed is still a thing, but any, any, anything you see on social media, it's, it's clickbait headlines. It's the same thing with podcasting, right? So my, my, my most popular episode twice over because I, in December I play repeats. So if I, if I sort by most popular, it's most popular twice. That that's how effective this is. And it's the top seven easily avoidable retirement mistakes. So, oh, okay. and that, which is a perfect blog post title, right? It's easily yep. avoidable. It's an odd number at the front. It's, it's, it's a listicle, right? So uh, it's just a blogging trick. Um, and people and so, love so, to hear about mistakes that always works. Tell me what mistakes other people are making so that I can learn from their mistakes and not make the same mistake. It's easily avoidable. So they're picturing an action item that they could take to avoid an embarrassment. Like it's just, it's just perfect bite size. They know exactly what to get and they're going to click on it. And it's, yeah. So that's my, my most popular episode twice over because it was successful as a repeat as well. And that's a great tip right there too. I tell people this all the time, whatever your most popular pieces of content are, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a tweet, you know, um, or a LinkedIn post, you should be sharing them more than once. If they were that popular the first time, they will be that popular the second time around. And, you know, nobody remembers every single piece of content someone else has released. So if somebody loved it the first time, they'll probably listen to it and love it again. And if they are newly exposed to you, it's a first opportunity for them to engage with it. So that's awesome. So what episode did you think would be a hit and wasn't? Yeah, this is really embarrassing. So, so there was, this was years ago, it's probably at least three or four years ago. There was a lot of, uh, all the financial media was all about the fiduciary rule. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it was back and forth and Obama was uh, for it and then Trump was against it. And it was just every, every piece of financial media was, was fiduciary role. And so I thought, what would be the most extreme standard that I could go to, to, to say, here's what a fiduciary would look like, right? It was all about disclosure and disclaimers and things like that. And I said, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hire a private investigator and I'm going to have a private investigator investigate me. And then I'm going to publish that, that private investigator's report as a lead magnet uh, affiliated with uh, this, this podcast episode, right? So I thought people would be like this voyeuristic aspect that people would want to, nobody downloaded it, zero downloads. I think my, I think like one person that like knew me personally downloaded it, uh, but nobody else would have any interest Well, that's at because all. anybody who really has something to hide isn't going to have someone do that. So people are probably like, oh, there's going to be nothing juicy. Probably, but it did have like my speedy tickets from like when I was a pizza delivery boy, like in high school. I'm like, it was pretty oh, thorough. No. Yeah. I hope you got a good tip on those, you know, otherwise the cost of the ticket outweighs the- Yeah, you'd be surprised, yeah. you know, sometimes <laughs> Midwesterners could be cheap, you know? Yes. Okay. Well, that's hilarious. So is that still available for listening if people want to go listen to it now? No. No, I, every once in a while, I'll kill 50 episodes. I'll just put them out to pasture just because legislation changes so frequently and, and I don't want a bad info out there. Plus, That's when you get smart. a super, when you get a super fan, they'll be like, "Oh, Benjamin, I went back and I listened to you know your two episodes, two hundred episodes in. I went back from episode zero and listened all through, and I know those episodes are so bad. Like that's just really cringe for me when people say that. So I just every once in a while I'll kill off fifty the first fifty episodes. So you mentioned super fans. Do you remember the first time you heard from somebody who you didn't know personally, and either like they left you a Google review or they were like, "I listened to this episode." Like, can you remember that moment? Yeah, so there's two, there's two, so there's two, there's this like C level, uh, D level celebrity uh, feel to it when you get somebody on the phone. And I play into that with my marketing sometimes, uh, but there's two. So, and this changed me as a podcaster forever because it, you can, as a podcaster, you can find prospects that can literally finish your sentences. And, and that's what happened. This, this client happened to be somewhat geographically local to me. Uh, she's a couple towns over and she came out of my office at, and we're, you know, just doing the normal thing. What are some of your retirement goals? And she said, I want to buy a second house in Denver uh, where my kids are. And I was like, oh, we help clients do that all the time. What we recommend is, and you could pick my jaw up off of the conference room table floor as she finished my sentences. Oh, Benjamin, you recommend renting in six months in a time before you buy it. I heard that on the podcast and I was like, this, this is life changing. These are, I don't have to, I, I get to go twice as far working half as hard because these prospects can literally finish my sentences. And so it was for that that time forward, I never ask for referrals. I only take new, I don't take any new clients anymore because this was just so successful, I guess, but uh, I never take a prospect that doesn't find me from my show just because I, it, I have wow. to work so much less hard. Uh, and the second time- That's awesome. So the second time was uh, a guy from Texas, a uh, fan of the show. Uh, he, I said, we know we meet clients over Zoom and he's like, Zoom's great, but I'm going to drive to Bismarck uh, to meet with you because I want to see if you're really about what you say that you're about, you know, so I'm going to come to your office. I want to make sure that you're the real deal. Uh, and the pressure is really on for me as a financial advisor, because if I couldn't close that client that drove all the way from Texas to Bismarck with no other reason to be here other than to hang out with me. Uh, and he brought my kids donuts, which was awesome. But uh, I, we did, he is still a client. We did close him, but that was that kind of D level celebrity feel is that someone drives clear across the country, uh, you know, cause they're a fan and they want to, you know, they want your advice. So, so those are my two, my two uh, celebrity sightings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, w- w- when you finally do hear from someone who you don't know personally, and it's not like a friend of a friend told them to listen to it or watch it. Um, I, I think that just is all the motivation most creators need to just keep going because you, it finally hits home. Like there are people out there that are finding this and, and listening to it. So you mentioned that you're located in, in Bismarck um, and there's this whole section on your podcasting website that talks about the benefits of working with an advisor remotely and how you do work with clients all over. And um, I just was curious, was this a strategy that you always you know, use from the time you started the podcast, you knew, okay, I am going to take people virtually, or did you really hone in on promoting that remote nature even more during the pandemic? Yeah. So the pandemic forced our hand, but we had already, we had already sort of started to put those things into place. So we had Zoom, we had ShareFile, we had Calendly, you know, some of these tech, tech pieces that are, that are starting to, you know, even some of our local clients now with the pandemic are, are opting to meet with us virtually. And then of course, with the podcast, nobody lives in North Dakota. There's like less than a million people in the whole state. Uh, So we knew that it was going to be. So at some point, even my local clients are going to be virtual. We want to be a hundred percent virtual someday. Now we've got uh, three, four-year-olds when they are 
in school full time, I want to be uh, traveling and, and doing some of those some of those sorts of things. So right now, traveling with three four year olds is not happening. So I'm sort of in Bismarck all the time. Um, so it works good for that now. But sometime I want to be fully virtual. Then the pandemic hit. I feel like we were already really poised to to take advantage of that. Uh, you know, the 10 year bull market where everybody's making double digit returns all the time was sort of over people that right were right on the cusp of retirement sort of fast forward to that retirement, uh, or felt like they needed more help. And so that's how we doubled our AUM went from, you know, the pandemic obviously sunk the market a little bit. So we went from like 48 million to 100 million from like, whatever it was, the bottom of the market in May of 2020 to July of 2021, from 48 million to 100 and whatever we're at now. And you mentioned that you've, you've capped out at the number of households you're serving. So you're not even signing anyone new right now. Yeah. So I, I still haven't worked out the language, but I, I'm going to say we're extremely limited in our ability to take on new clients. So I'm going to be working with a coaching program to send my listeners to qualified advisors that I've mentored and are familiar with the same, you know, concepts and things like that. So that's wonderful. So what would you say now that you've kind of reached that maximum as you think about the purpose of your podcast? I mean, before it was really to attract new business. Uh, what's the plan? What, what do you, you know, what's the goal for how to use the podcast then to move the needle in some way? So now I'm going back, I'm going to go back to growing the podcast. Uh, when, when new podcasters start, they say, oh, Bob Benjamin, you've got, you know, 30, 40,000 downloads a month. You've got a million lifetime download. That's what I want. And I would caution them to say that if that's your pursuit, that that's the wrong pursuit. You want to pursue engagement, right? The most successful financial advisor podcaster that I know is Adam Schmela, who gets like two or 300 downloads an episode, but he's so hyper-focused that he's got two or 300 hyper-engaged listeners that are eventually going to become his clients or send clients to him. That's what you want. You want hyper-engagement. Uh, everything else is just a flex, right? Download numbers are a flex, not important to the bottom line. But now that I'm pivoting, it, it is going to be more than a flex. It's going to be important to the bottom line, growing the audience, because I'm going to have a listener-facing course, and I'm also going to send my listeners to qualified advisors, and of course, I get a, a, a big on that. So, uh, so I'm going to pivot from engagement to engagement and growth. So, you know, I'm going to go for 50,000, 100,000, whatever it is, downloads a month uh, to, to change that because I want people to buy my course, but I also want to point them to qualified advisors as well. That's wonderful. And, so and we have sponsors now too. I was we have, we have sponsors not- for the show. I was going to ask about the the sponsors. Um, and I know that people who are just starting out in the podcast world, often that's like a pipe dream to ever get a sponsor. Did, was that something that you sought out or did it happen more organically? Like they came to you? How did that work? So about it. yeah, yeah. I got no secret. So, so a good friend of mine and, and a coach of mine, Stephanie Bogan always reminded me. Oh, I love Stephanie. To, yeah. Yeah. So, so two mentors of mine, Stephanie Bogan and Ron Swanson. Uh, Stephanie Bogan says, uh, make the one thing the one thing, right? So so all of this shiny stuff, and you're an entrepreneur, Samantha, most financial advisors, especially podcasters are entrepreneurs. And so there's all these shiny things all the time that can distract your attention from the one thing, but you got to make the one thing the one thing. Ron Swanson would say, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. And so <laughs> I needed to just do the just do the podcast and just do my AUM uh, only. But now that I hit 100 million, it was always my goal to hit 100 million by my 40th birthday, which is September 2nd. So, and that was like a five year goal from like 38 million when I started with Stephanie to 100 million. And so it's 18, 19, 20, and halfway through 21, you know, triple it in three and a half years. Uh, but now that that's done, I can focus on the next thing. So, the next thing was like get some sponsors to pay for the show. I paid about $3,000 a month. Uh, for the show because all I do is press record. Uh, so that you know, there's a lot of freelancers behind the scenes to, to make that happen for me. Uh, so, so some sponsors to pay for the show, uh, listener facing content. Now that they can't engage with me directly one-on-one, I want them to be able to engage with me at scale. So of course it'd be great for that. I'm going to have a lot of guest lecturers, financial advisor friends of mine that are going to do like case studies and things like that. Uh, and then, uh, and then sponsors, uh, listener facing content, and then, and then advisor lead referrals. So I could have done all of those sooner, but that would have been a distraction from my keeping the one thing, the one thing. So I love that quote. I've heard her say it before and it's such a good piece of advice. I often forget it myself and I think I need to put it up behind my computer or something. We and all are, really- squir- we have that squirrel brain, right? There's, there's, you know, nut, 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 you know, so just and a lot you of see that shiny are- thing and you want to chase it. Yeah, the things that are most distracting are immediately rewarding. Like, oh, I got, you know, a bunch of people to respond to this post on social media. Uh, So left to our own devices, we have 10 (laughs) semi-completed projects rather than the one thing that matters making progress on, right? Right. 
So I have a couple questions about promotion I'm going to get to, um, but just to sort of start, when you were using this podcast as a client, um, you know, a new client growth model, what did you have a, like a process in place in terms of like a funnel? Like, okay, I get someone to listen. Were you just hoping that eventually they would listen and then they would pick up the phone and call you because they were wowed by what you were sharing? Or did you have any kind of devices, marketing devices in place to create a, a true funnel so that you could get them to land on a page and collect their information in some way? So I started out with just that non-approach approach where I've just published a podcast and I hope that they would call me eventually. Roger Whitney is a friend of mine. He would talk about Grow Your Orchard. He, he, he's really firm on don't ask for iTunes uh, iTunes uh, reviews. Don't ask for somebody to pick up the phone. Nurture, 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 and then when they're ready, they'll call you. Uh, that work. That works. You should definitely do that. Uh, but one tweak that I made is that I never talk about picking up the phone and calling me until until I do ask for that. And actually, I did a very special call to action on December thirty first last year, and that led to twenty five million dollars in new assets up to this you know up to last month essentially. Wow. But. So my, my hope they pick up the phone eventually changed when I res, read Russell Brunson's uh, online marketer secret, sort of that book is the click funnels guy. And he talks about a value driven sales funnel, right? So it's this stair step approach and he'll sell you a free book plus shipping. And then you'll, you know, attend this $97 webinar who helps sell you do a 497 webinar. Then you join his inner circle for $25,000 a year, or whatever. It's this very specific, you know, uh, you trust him with $5 and he exceeds your expectation with 10 and you trust him with 15, he gives you a hundred. That's what we need as financial advisors. We don't have that. We don't have books. We don't have courses. We don't have any of those things. We just have, hi, nice to meet you, Samantha. Can I have your life savings, right? It's a little <laughs> bit of a tricky, that's a tough putt, right? So I knew I, 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 knew I, I couldn't do that with money because I don't have books. I don't have courses. I don't have online coaching. I just have AUM with a million dollar minimum, right? That's a, that's a tough putt. So I said, what do I have? I have time, right? I have time. So uh, you tune in for a 20 minute episode. I got to exceed your expectations. Then I offer you a lead magnet. Uh, through my through my email or through my you know my blog post slash podcast are kind of the same thing, and so you trust me with your email, which is free, but you know that that's an exchange an agreed to be agreement to be marketed upon. I have to exceed your expectations with that. Uh, then I invite you to like a webinar or an office hours or something. I tr you trust me with thirty minutes or an hour of your time. Then, uh, but that's one to many. Then you trust me with a one on one. Uh, intro call where we get to speak one-on-one. -on -one. There's a little bit of that celebrity factor in there. Wow, Ben, I can't believe I'm actually talking to you, all that stuff, right? Then they trust me with their financial information, right? So there's this very specific process of uh, I, I, they're trusting me with something. I'm exceeding the expectations. Trust, exceed, trust, exceed. And then it's not crazy for me to ask for their life savings because they've been interacting with me for a long time. Yeah, that's such a smart um, way to put it. And it's something that we as marketers have seen work for years, right? Like if you want to collect a bunch of information from somebody, uh, you first say just like, what's your name and email? And then after they put that in, the next page that pops up, instead of it being the thing, it might just say, great. And one more question so we can give you the exact right information. And then they answer the third. Whereas we know that for every additional form field, we ask someone to fill out just straight up front the conversion rate goes down. So keeping it super simple, you know, it allows them to get that buy-in. Like, okay, I'm only one step away from getting it now. Right. If you get somebody to say yes three times, they're going to say yes the fourth time and the fifth time, right? Right. But it's the, it's the first couple that are the hardest. So getting people to actually go to that web page, um, because I think that is one of the hardest challenges with podcasting is if somebody does listen, they like what they hear, but they're in their car or they're cooking dinner, you know, what did you do to sort of reinforce that, go here to get something or to give me your email to sign up for this? Was it just something you'd mention in every episode or how did you approach that? Yeah. So, so podcasting is, is great in some ways because of its utility, right? You can listen to a podcast while you cut your grass or work out, but you're less engaged than a YouTube video. But when you're watching YouTube, you, you can only watch YouTube, right? That, that's really all you can do. So there's significant pluses and significant minuses. I live on all my prospects phones. I mean, people would pay millions of dollars to live in the prospects phones, right? So significant pluses, but also minuses in that there's a lot of friction. I have to get them to navigate away from their phone or stop multitasking in order to have them engage with my next piece of content, right? So uh, how I generally get my listeners isn't, I don't think from the podcast first, it's from, from Google SEO. So I rank for retirement podcast. So when someone searches for retirement podcast, they're, they're messaging something really specific in that I wanna learn more about retirement planning. Not I want to roll over my 401k. I want to do Roth conversion. That's transactional, right? 
they're asking to be nurtured when they when they search retirement podcasts. So I've been uh, for I don't do anything at all now, uh, but for years and years I, I targeted that term retirement podcast. And anytime, you know, if my friends were for Kiplinger's or Forbes, you know, I, I suggested let's do a retirement podcast themed episode for the backlinks and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's how I did it. So I'm getting them from the blog first, probably. Uh, and the blog and the podcast are the same thing, right? They're, in the eyes of Google, they're exactly the same, which we can talk about. Uh, so then hopefully they're downloading one of my resources, right? I have this ultimate retiree toolkit, which I made one time back in like 2015 or 2016, never changed it. And it still drives lots of... Uh, you know, people to my email list all the time. So hopefully I'm either getting them from the podcast or from the blog, but then I'm connecting those dots. So I have them on my weekly newsletter and I have them on my weekly show. And so we're engaging twice a week uh, on, on all fronts. Um, so that's how I'm starting to get that, that momentum of them engaging with my content. So I can either talk to them through the podcast or I can talk to them through the, through the, the newsletter. Now, when that doesn't work, I have some, I, I use a, something on my WordPress uh, site called Pretty Link, where I can mention um, we're doing our annual survey right now, our listener survey, and, which is like surveymonkey.com slash a bunch of stuff that no one could ever remember, right? Or they've got to click through to the show notes, which is different depending on how they listen to the show. But I, if you go to retirementstartstodayradio.com slash blank, I won't say what it is because you, you guys will mess up my numbers. But if you go to retirementstartstodayradio.com slash blank, it, it pretty link redirects to that survey monkey thing. So you can speak it, they can remember it, and they'll navigate to it after the fact. Got it. Got it. So, okay. So that reduces that friction is if you give them something memorable to navigate to. So uh, I, I, I do want to spend some time now talking about SEO. We brought it up a couple of times. It is such an important part of how people find podcasts to begin with. Um, and I also noticed, you know, when I was preparing for the interview that I was looking back at some of your first, you know, podcast and the web pages you had on the podcast website. So initially it might just be the embedded you know, file that you can click play and listen to. And then below it, maybe like a one paragraph summary versus now, you know, episode 199, 200, you've got bullet points, you've got timestamps of what you cover. You've got links out to resources you mentioned. Um, so I was interested, you know, what prompted this change? Like when you started to realize you wanted to do more robust pages for the episodes themselves and what kind of organic SEO results you've noticed since employing that strategy. I'll bet, I'll bet you could guess when I was going from one paragraph to a fully fledged uh, blog post with timestamps, I'll bet you could guess what the difference was. Uh, I was going to say a, like a threefold, fourfold uh, difference in organic traffic. Th that's true. That's true. That came after I hired a freelancer. I hired somebody else to do okay. it for me. So that was a big thing. So, so when it was just a paragraph, it was like, oh man, it's, it's uh, 5 a.m. and my podcast goes live at six, I better like put together three sentences before my kids wake up. Uh, so I was giving a 20% effort uh, and getting like a 10% result. So I just hired a freelancer podcast fast track. Uh, and now they do it for me. And it's 100 times better. And it costs me like $655 a month, you know, Could which do. is a yeah. lot. But if you have 100 million AUM, it's nothing. And my, one of the things that I've always said, it doesn't matter if you're creating video, podcast, anything, the, you know, the search engine cannot read the audio file or the video file the way it can read the text on the page. So you need to type not it yet. all out. Not yet, but that's not coming. Yet. <laughs> you need to type it all out uh, for the search engine to easily crawl and make those connections. And then, you know, the, any of the hyperlinks that you're adding in to previous episodes also just make for a better user experience for someone who actually visits the web page. And it potentially gives you something to talk about um, you know, when you're podcasting, you can say, we'll link <laughs> the resources that we mentioned here on this page. So people want to go see it. Or I hear podcasters all the time say, we'll have the picture that we're talking about discussing right now on that page. So just something to sort of get people there. It also helps with that. But I don't think a lot of times people recognize the SEO value of just going beyond a one paragraph summary. And blogging is podcasting. Podcasting is blogging. Everything that works for bloggers is about to work for podcasters. So the, there's a different SEO beast though, in terms of just having people find your podcast, like if they're on the podcasting app and they're doing a search there. Um, so talk to me about, you know, how you're choosing topics and titling the episodes there from an SEO perspective. Are you searching ahead of time what people are looking for? Do you use a tool for that? No. So I, I think I'm, I'm spoiled that I have a little bit of a first mover advantage, right? I have the social proof of 203 episodes and whatever it is. I don't know if I have 30 or 30,000 iTunes reviews. I don't look at that really, but I have, the, I know that I have enough to have social proof. So if somebody sees my show, it's going to stand out, but 
the, a new person can't do that. So I recognize that I have that advantage. But I think when, when a person first finds your show, they're going to listen to the most recent episode. And if you exceed their expectations, they're going to scroll back, back through your last five or 10 episodes. And, and, and that's why you don't need a sexy title every single episode, but every third or fourth, you need that to be a rock star. In the blogging world, we would call that a pillar post, right? We need to have a pillar post type show and type title every time, because those are going to be the shows that they download, right? So I, I loved your first show. I trust you with 20 minutes. I liked it. I'm going to go through your last 10 or 15 shows. I'm going to pick up two or three. If, if you exceed their expectations there, that's a subscriber for life, right? So, so that's, that's sort of what I think about when I'm writing titles. And now somebody writes titles for me, but generally that's. <laughs> uh, so would you say which comes first, like creating a title, like a sexy title for these pillar episodes or just having a list of topics and you're like, okay, I want to talk about this this week and then I'll create the title after the fact. Sometimes, uh, so it all depends. We do, a, we do uh, retirement headlines every episode and that's our sponsored segment now. So we have to do it every episode. Uh, usually the, the person that makes the titles and writes the blog post will, will sort of take that retirement headline and they'll tweak it in some way to, to, cause that's the kind of the pillar of the, the core of the content. But sometimes when I'm, when I'm preparing the show and kind of reading through and making my notes and stuff, I'll, I'll have some inspiration of like a sexy title post, uh, and then I'll, I'll swap that out. So whatever's okay. at the top of the Google doc is what the episode title is. So if I ignore it, then she makes it. Do you keep yourself a running list of these are the episodes I want to talk about coming up and sort of pick from that as time goes on? How do you come up with ideas for, for your content? So this is an, uh, I stole this idea from uh, Adam Carolla and Michael Kitsis, uh, both kind of a hybrid. Uh, Adam Carolla does, I think it's like seven different shows that he does. So he has multiple shows that come up per day and all the shows are segment based. Uh, so that he doesn't have to, to think live eight hours a day, he has segments, right? So, so his brain can switch, boom, 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 boom. Each segment has a, has a, a sting and, and an intro and an outro and things like that. Uh, and then Michael Kitsis does executive summaries, right? He's got an 8,000 word blog post, but you can read in 500 words what the executive summary is. So, so I stole from both of those ideas uh, and I said, I'm going to do segment based. I know I have enough listener questions that I could do listener questions forever. And there's enough retirement headlines that I could do those forever. So that's a two part. So my brain can kind of switch and do two things rather than just 40 minutes of, of a blank blinking cursor, you know, in the form of a microphone. So, so that's what I do. So I'll find an interesting, uh, on Twitter, usually an interesting retirement headline, uh, you know, read the article, send it to my pre-production team. They'll make an executive summary in a script form. And then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of read the script to keep me on track. And then I'll answer a listener question at the end, targeting about 20 minutes per episode. Okay. Um, so uh, that's essentially how I get my content. I see something that I think my, you know, I have an avatar listener. I see something that I'm interested in. I think they might be interested in it's lifestyle or it's something planning specific. Actually now lately we've been doing some travel episodes because it's, you know, so in theory, post COVID summer. Yeah. yeah. In theory, we'll see. Uh, but that's how I, that's how I get my content now. I see something that I think they're interested in and I have them make an executive summary. I think what's so interesting about that strategy too is even if you don't have listeners yet and you're just starting, you probably have clients that are asking questions all the time that you can turn those client questions into topics. I mean, we've always recommended that as a way to create any kind of content, a blog, YouTube video, podcast. Um, and then, you know, the retirement headlines, you know, just to make sure everybody listening understands when you say retirement headlines, all you're talking about is what's in the news regarding retirement for Americans today and talking about it. And it, it makes so much sense too, because if the pandemic taught us anything, you know, when we look at research of what kind of content people are consuming, evergreen content is way less popular than timely current event-based content. And I think it's just, we all felt like the world was moving at such a fast pace and things were changing so quickly all the time. Um, and it's become, you know, something that is, it just works better to resonate with that audience. And it feels more, more timely, but you know, to your point earlier, I I do know sometimes people will say, well, then that makes me nervous that if somebody comes to listen to the podcast and they're looking at back episodes, it's not going to make sense anymore because it was from a year ago and it was super timely for that moment. So are those some of the episodes that you go back and kind of get rid of and delete off of the, the roster, the ones that are like so timely and no longer relevant? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think about that too much, uh, but I do every so often I'll email my, one of my producers, Steve Stewart, and I'll say, yeah, let's zap the last, you know, the most, the oldest 50 episodes. Uh, okay. My mind is more thinking about legislative changes and something that I said then that was like good actionable advice it is not that anymore. So uh, yeah, and in theory, I'm improving every time I publish an episode. So a hundred episodes ago, I was much poorer of a podcaster than I am now. So maybe that's like, uh, uh, you know, self-critical or something, but um, I'm thinking about that as well. I mean, I think people sometimes will say that, but if you're not getting better after you've done something 200 times, there's probably something wrong. You should be getting better. You should be better at episode 200 than episode one. You should always look back at something you did six months, a year ago and be a little bit embarrassed. If you're not, that means you're not improving. Right. Or I always say, you know, people will get nervous about starting something new. And I always say, if you don't look back at the first iteration of something and cringe just a little bit, it means you started too late. You know, we just have to get, you just have to remove the fear and, and do it. So um, I know we were coming up on time. A couple just other questions I wanted to ask that I know a lot of people are curious about when they're starting this journey is time commitment. So obviously where you are now and having people help you is very different than where you started. But how much of your time does the podcast take up every, you said it's biweekly now. So um, maybe every month, you know, everything from researching, whatever you need to do, reading the articles, um, recording it, actually promoting it. What, if you had to give an estimate, what would you say? So right now I spend about an hour and a half on the show every week. You know, it's about a half an hour of recording time and then about an hour of, you know, prepping and researching and, and sort of just getting, you, you got to kind of wrap your head around the episode and, and find the planning points and the action items and, it's not so much just reading an article. I mean, you, you can't just read out of a, the CFP manual, right? Nobody would listen for that. But you've got to say, you know, here's the retirement headline. Here's what I agree with or I disagree with. Or here's something that came up that relates to the article in my practice this week. And here's how we help solve them, right? People are looking for wisdom more so than knowledge. Um, so I guess your question is, how much do I dedicate an hour and a half per week? Um, the newsletter, I don't touch at all now. Somebody else does that completely. For the show, I just press record and put it in the Google Drive. All pre-production, all post-production is totally outsourced now, which is why we need sponsors to keep the show viable now that we're not taking uh, clients from the show anymore. Um, but I would say when you start out, you know, just, just do one thing at a time, right? You don't have to mirror what I'm doing. I'm 200 iterations in, right? J all you've got to do is, is sit down, press record, find somebody on Fiverr to edit it for you. Uh, if not, you have to listen to the show two or three times through it. So 20 minutes becomes like an hour and a half. Um, so delegate as quickly as you can outsource as quickly as you can but you know for starting out you're probably going to spend even for like a you know a, a lesser version than i have if you're not doing show notes if you're not doing a blog post if you're not doing thumbnails if you're not doing a newsletter um you're probably going to spend two or three hours per show for a 20 minute show okay that's good that's good for people to know the other question that i think a lot of people are always curious about are you know what it takes after you've hit record to actually get it out there and market it. And we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, SEO being a big part of it, but what about like, you know, some of the things you only have to do once, but they do make a big difference, like sourcing your music or creating a thumbnail. Um, did you have multiple iterations of that throughout your, your show and they kind of got better as you've gone along, or did you even have some of those things when you first got started? Yeah, I just, I get kind of bored easy uh, and I like silly things. So, you know, the music changed back in like 2016 and I kept it the same ever since. Uh, there's this band I followed in high school named Limbeck and they had this song called Silver, Silver Things. And I went to FinCon and they were playing at a dive bar in uh, that, the soda bar in San Diego. And I met with the guy after the show and I said, hey, can I use your song? He said, yes, nothing in writing at all. So I hope this doesn't bite me in the ass someday. But we've been <laughs> using that song ever since. He said, oh, I'm honored that you want me to just like exactly like you would expect some super cool musician dude to say, right? Uh, so that was the song. So I like the song a lot and the audience loves the show, loves the song now it's in their brain. So hopefully I never change it. Uh, but with segments, you know, I get bored with things. So, so I'll, I'll do little tags, uh, on the front end, hire voice actors to pretend that they're the law and order guy, or, uh, I, I had, I had my audience come up with fake movie titles, um, to, to do our listener question segments. So just silly things that just kind of keep it interesting for me because I get bored easy. And they make it fun to listen to for sure. And get to your point engagement, like whenever you can get the audience to get involved in that way. Uh, well, financial it. playing is tricky, right? Because it's extremely important 
right? But it's also extremely boring for people that aren't like you and I that are sort of nerds for this stuff. So we have like a, like a twofold task is that we have to get people this important information. We have to do it in a way that they'll actually consume it, which is make it fun. So uh, right. it's, it's just a tricky thing to do. So you've got to think outside the box. Exactly. And so many people are hiding from the reality of their finances in a lot of ways. So they, they don't want to listen to it because they don't want to be reminded. I'm, well, sure. I'm watching you, um, you know, talking to this, this great microphone and your voice. You have a great voice for podcasting. I'm sure many people have told you that. But what, when you first started out, did you have all of the same sort of tech and gadgets that you have today? Or, you know, were you, did you start, you know, kind of with what you had? Was there certain things you bought to get started? Yeah, so I watched Pat Flynn's, uh, Pat Flynn is a smart passive income podcast, and, and I just watched his intro videos on how to start a podcast. I just bought everything that he had, uh, which was like a $200 uh, digital recorder and a $200 microphone. But then I started kind of geeking out on, on audio and stuff, so I bought like the uh, Shure SM7. B, which is the microphone that they use to record Thriller. Uh, and it's the microphone that um, a lot of different podcasts you might know of. And then I got the cool mixing board with all the lights and the little lever things that nobody's really secretly, nobody is really sure what they do, but they look really cool. But in reality, in reality, I talk on a $60. This is actually a handy down microphone from Steve Stewart. It's a ATR 2100. Uh, so I have all the cool stuff and it looks cool if you go in my office at my house. But in reality, Almost all of my episodes are recorded from inside my car with a $60 microphone on a, on a $100 digital uh, recorder because I'm outside of my kid's hockey game and I only have 20 minutes. Uh, and so essentially 80, 80 to 90% of my episodes are recorded in my car, in my uh, 2019 uh, GMC Yukon. Oh, you gave us the make and model too. So yeah. good acoustics. I was going to say, I find sometimes if, if I'm trying to do something and I'm at home, it gets too echoey. So the car actually has much better like soundproofing and it's a good place to record things. Yeah. You know, uh, so like the engine running or uh, so a, a, if a kid runs in and screams, it's really hard for your editor to cut that out specifically because it's a, it's a spike. Right. But if your, if your kid just stood behind you and screamed the whole time, an editor could pull that out because you can separate that, right? Uh, so your engine running or AC running, it's easy to strip that out because that's just one sound that's constant. So don't right. worry about the background noise because that can be cut out. Worry about like the distractive noises. We are really in the work from anywhere um, world these days. And it's mm -hmm. really exciting. I mean, the fact, like you said, you can do it in 20 minutes outside your car. I commit to recording a quick four minute marketing tip video every single week. And I was in between offices for a couple of weeks and I recorded some in my car and I have to tell you, they perform sometimes even better because they look even more organic in, uh, in people's feeds. Well, listen, all of the tips that you gave us today and just hearing your story has been so inspiring. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk us through it. Um, I just wondered one last question. If, if somebody was on the fence about getting started with the podcast, especially right now, like feeling like maybe it's oversaturated, what would you say to them? Uh, I would say that the next financial advisor podcaster that takes your clients away from you, uh, thanks you greatly. <laughs> I love that. Okay. You heard it here first. All right. Well, thanks so much and can't wait to keep listening.